five, four, three, two, one. Um, um, this is the Planning and Zoning Committee, and I'm just giving everyone a second to get settled, but uh, I'll do a quick run through of our attendance. Um, Councilmember Bradford is present. Um, Councilmember Hager is not gonna be able to make it. I know um, Councilmember Parker is present. Councilmember Rutherford is present. Councilmember Toombs, Van Rees, and Welsh. So that gives us a quorum. Uh, we have seven at the moment, and I will mark others present if they are able to join us. I know we're starting a little bit early today. Um, let me just double check that one thing. We do have a lengthy agenda. A lot of things I'm gonna place on consent, and, and that will take me a little while to read through, but one of those I know I still need to pull off of consent. Let's see. Councilmember Rosenberg, um, which item was it that you wanted to pull from consent? Item number six. Okay, got it. All right, I think I have everything ready to go. So I will read through the items that are on our consent agenda. Um, those start with item number one, which is resolution R RS 2022-1578. Item number two, resolution RS 2022 1828, is not on consent. That one we need to discuss. Item number three, RS 2022 1857. Item number four, RS 2022 1877. Item number five, ordinance BL 2022 1532. Item number seven, ordinance BL 2022 1534. Item number eight, BL 2022-1535. This one, it does have an amendment. Um, however, it's housekeeping. And so um, in the interest of time, uh, we'd, we'd like to have that on consent unless council disagrees, because we have a few that are like that. Um, but if there's no objection, there's a couple of these that just have housekeeping. But we'll go ahead and place those on consent for approval. Item number nine, Ordinance Bill 2022-1536. Item number 10, Ordinance Bill 2022-1537. Uh, item 11, 1538. Item 12, 1539. Item 13, which is 1540. 1541, 1542. For item number 16, Councilmember Rutherford, um, I understand you have a request for a deferral for one meeting. Is that, that correct? And also for item number 17. Okay, so we'll have those on consent before one meeting deferral. Item number 18, um, Councilmember Parker, uh, BL 2022-1140. Um, item number 19, BL 2022-1290. Items 20 and 21 will not be on consent. Item 22 will not be on consent. Item 23, Ordinance Bill 2022-1437. This one has a substitute, however, it's also housekeeping to change the, the name of the street to reflect its present name. We've got a couple of those. Uh, item 24, Bill 2022-1446 uh, also applies to the street name. The substitute does. Item number 25, Bill 2022-1472 is on consent. 1473 is on consent. Item number 27, which is also Councilman O'Connell, uh, also has a substitute, which is also housekeeping about the name of the street, so I'd like to keep that on consent if there's no objection. Item number 28. Um, item number 29. Item 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, and 42. So um, if any of those items need to come off consent, please let me know, because it'll take me a while to read through it. But um, that way we can get, get on to the matters that do need discussion. Um, so seeing none, I'll go ahead and read through all of those captions, <laughs> and um, we will go from there. So 
The consent calendar is item one, resolution RS 2022-1578. The sponsors are Council Member Sledge, Allen Withers and Young, which is a participation agreement between Metro and acting through Metro Water and 1302 Pillow Street LLC for public water service improvements for Pillow Street's proposed development. Item number three, resolution RS 2022-1857. The sponsors are Council Members Hauser, Roth Roten, Withers, and others to clear surplus and authorize conveyance of real property to certain nonprofit organizations and authorizing grants not to exceed 15 million and a little bit extra from the Barnes Fund for affordable housing to certain nonprofit organizations selected for the express purpose of constructing and rehabilitating affordable or workforce housing. Item number four, resolution RS 2022-1877. Sponsors are Council Members Van Reese, Withers and Pulley amends Ordinance Bill 2022-1267 to accept additional sanitary sewer manhole for property located at 121 Hart Lane. Item number five, Ordinance Bill 2022-1532, sponsors Councilmember Bradford, extend the boundaries of the Urban Services District to include certain pro properties located in Council District 13 and approving the plan of services. Item number seven, Ordinance Bill 2022-1534, the sponsors are Council Members Evans, Roten, Suara, and others, approves and authorizes Director of Public Property Administration to accept a donation of real property consisting of approximately 9.53 acres located at 1209 Tulip Grove Road um, and 0 Tulip Grove Road for use as a proposed school site. Item number eight, Ordinance Bill 2022-1535. The sponsors are Council Members Roten, Withers, and Pulley. Um, authorizes the Director of Public Property or designee to transfer to the state of Tennessee uh, any remaining fee interest in the metro... Um, the Metropolitan Government has for a portion of a right away of Broadway Avenue in front of Union Station. And that one does have an amendment, which is housekeeping. Item number nine, um, Ordinance Bill 2022-1536. The sponsors are Council Members Withers and Pulley. Authorizes Metro Government to remove existing sanitary sewer main to abandon existing sanitary sewer main main sanitary sewer manholes and easements and to accept new sanitary sewer and water mains, manholes and easements for five properties located on Lebanon Pike, also known as Lebanon Pike Apartments. Item number 10, Ordinance Bill 2022-1537, the sponsors are Council Members Bradford, Withers and Pulley, authorizes Metro Government to abandon existing sanitary sewer main, sanitary sewer manholes and easements and to accept new sanitary sewer main, manholes and easements for property located at 1007 Thompson Place. Item number 11, the sponsors Sponsors are Council Members, our Ordinance Bill 2022-1538. The sponsors are Council Members Parker, Withers, and Pulley. Authorizes Metro Government to accept new sanitary sewer manhole for property located at Panic Avenue, unnumbered. Item number 12, Ordinance Bill 2022-1539. The sponsors are Council Members Withers and Pulley. Authorizes Metro Government to abandon existing sanitary sewer uh, existing water and sanitary sewer mains, manhole and easements to replace an existing sanitary sewer manhole and accept new water and sanitary sewer manhole mains, fire hydrant assembly, and sanitary sewer manholes and easements. For two properties located at 601 Crutcher Street and 730 Lenore Street, also known as KC Utilities Phase 1B. Item number 13, Ordinance Bill 2022-1540. The sponsors are Council Members Withers and Pulley. Authorizes Metro Government to accept new pu public fire hydrant assembly for property located at 200 Broadway. Item number 14, Ordinance Bill 2022-1541. The sponsors are Council Members Lee, Withers and Pulley. Authorizes Metro Government to accept new sanitary sewer main manhole, fire hydrant assembly, and easements for property located at 4119 Murfreesboro Pike, also known as Freedom Storage. Item number 15, Ordinance Bill 2022-1542. The sponsors are Council Members Withers and Pulley. Authorizes Metro Government to abandon existing public water main and to accept new public water main and fire hydrant assembly for property located at 1217 Phillips Street, also known as Clark UMC Residential. Item number 16, Ordinance Bill 2022-1061. Sponsors Council Member Rutherford amends the Metro Zoning Code by changing from AR 2A to SP Zoning for property located at 1465 Old Hickory Boulevard. Um, and that one is on consent for a one meeting deferral at the request of the sponsor. Item number 17, Ordinance Bill 2022-1062 is the materials restriction for the same property um, from Council Member Rutherford who's also requested a one meeting deferral. 
Item number 18, substitute ordinance bill 2022-1140, uh, sponsors Councilmember Parker and others, amends the Metro Zoning Code by changing from RM20 to SP properties. Uh, to SP for properties located at 301 North 2nd Street and 651 and 660 Joseph Avenue uh, to permit a mixed-use development. Um, and that one is on consent. Item number 19, BL 2022-1290, the sponsors Councilmember Taylor amends the Metro Zoning Code by changing from RS5 to R6A zoning for property located at 1712 Arthur Avenue. Next is item number 23, uh, Ordinance Bill 2022-1437, the sponsors Councilmember O'Connell amends the Metro Zoning Code by applying a historic landmark overlay district for property located at 627 Second Avenue South. Um, and that one has a substitute, which is housekeeping for the street name. Item number 24, Ordinance Bill 2022-1446, the sponsors Councilmember O'Connell amends the Metro Zoning Code by changing from Downtown Code to SP Zoning for properties located at 507, 509, 511, 515, 517, 519, and 521 Second Avenue South, 203 Peabody Street, and 518 Third Avenue South um, to permit two multifamily residential buildings and one hotel building. That one is on consent with a substitute uh, to correct the street name. Item number 25, Ordinance Bill 2022-1472, the sponsors Councilmember O'Connell amends the Metro Zoning Code to refine site plan review procedures within the downtown code um, relating to approval of concept plans and final site plans within the downtown code zoning district. Item number 26, substitute ordinance bill 2022-1473, the sponsors Councilmember Rosenberg amends the um, amends section 17 uh, dot 40 dot zero one zero of the Metro code to require written notice to neighboring property owners of the decision to grant or deny a reasonable accommodation. Item number 27, Ordinance Bill 2022-1485, the sponsors Councilman O'Connell. This also pertains to the historic landmark overlay district at 627 Second Avenue South, which the substitute um, references uh, is the the correct street name. Item number 28, Ordinance Bill 2022-1486, the sponsors Councilmember Syracuse amends the Metro Zoning Code by changing from R15 to SP zoning for property located at 2600 Pennington Bend Road. Item number 29, Ordinance Bill 2022-1487, the sponsors Councilmember Syracuse, and this is the materials restriction for the same property. Item number 30, Ordinance Bill 2022-1488, the sponsors Councilmember Tombs Metro, amends the Metro Zoning Code by changing from R6 to RM20 A and S zoning for property located at 1718 Pecan Street or Pecan Street, depending on where you're from. Um, that one's on consent. Item 31, BL 2022-1489, the sponsors Councilmember Sledge amends the Metro Zoning Code by changing from R6 to MUA and S zoning for property located at 760 East Argyle Avenue. Item number 32, Ordinance Bill 2022-1492, the sponsors Councilmember Parker amends the Metro Zoning Code by changing from IWD to RM15ANS, zoning for property located at 806 Cherokee Avenue. Item number 33, Ordinance Bill 2022-1493, the sponsors are Councilmember Van Rees and Allen, amends the Metro Zoning Code by changing from RS10 to RM20 and RM40, zoning for various properties located west of Ellington Parkway and east of Walton Lane. Item number 34, Ordinance Bill 2022-1494, the sponsors are Councilmember Van Rees and Allen, amends the Metro Zoning Code by canceling a portion of a plain unit development overlay district on various properties located west of Ellington Parkway and east of Walton Lane. Item number 35, Ordinance Bill 2022-1495, the sponsors Councilmember O'Connell amends the Metro Zoning Code by changing from R6A to RM20A and S zoning for property located at 5 Decatur Street. Item number 36, Ordinance Bill 2022-1497. I am the sponsor of this one. It amends the Metro Zoning Code by changing from CS and IR to SP zoning for property located at 515 Crutcher Street. Item number 37, Ordinance Bill 2022-1498. The sponsors Councilmember Syracuse amends the Metro Zoning Code by changing from R8 to SP zoning for property located at 114 Cottage Lane. 
Item number 38, the uh, Ordinance Bill 2022-1499, the sponsors Councilmember Stiles amends the Metro Zoning Code by changing from SP to MUL zoning on property located at 5400 Mount View Road. Item number 39, Ordinance Bill 2022-1500, uh, sponsors Councilmember Welsh amends the Metro Zoning Code by changing from RS 7.5 to R8A zoning for properties located at 3104 Mead Avenue and 436 Patterson Street. Item number 40, Ordinance Bill 2022-1501. The sponsors, Councilmember Parker, amends the Metro Zoning Code by changing from RS5 to R6A zoning for property located at West Sharp Avenue unnumbered. Item number 41, Ordinance Number Bill 2022-1503. The sponsors, Councilmember Bradford, amends the Metro Zoning Code by changing from RS10 to SP zoning for properties located at 903 and 925 Massman Drive and Massman Drive unnumbered. Um, item number 42, Ordinance Bill 2022-1504, uh, Councilmember Bradford, this is the materials restriction for that above property. All right, do any of those need to come off of the consent calendar for any reason? All right. Seeing none, I will call on Vice Chair Rutherford for a motion. I move approval of the consent agenda. Thank you, sir. We have a motion and a second. All in discussion, all in favor, please say aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Great, now we can get down to discussion on some of the other matters. So the first one is Item number two, resolution RS 2022-1828. Uh, the sponsors are myself, council members Roten and Hurt. This requests that the division of purchases with the assistance of the Department of Planning issue a solicitation for development of portions of the Nissan Stadium campus. We do have three amendments for those. Um, could I get um, a motion on uh, so we have a motion on that and a second at least to move for a discussion and then we do have some amendments and the first one is from Councilmember Mendez and I will recognize you now. Thank you, Chair. Um, at the meeting two weeks ago, I mentioned that I'd had a conversation with the administration about possibly offering an amendment on this one to clarify that moving ahead with the RFP um, does not uh, indicate any commitment by the Metro Council to approve any other pending or future legislation related to the East Bank or a potential um, new stadium, and that instead it would just be an indication of approving the mayor's office, further exploring the possibility of working with a private development partner subject to the terms of the resolution. And so this Amendment 1 um, does what uh, I mentioned um, a couple weeks ago. So okay. would ask that it be moved and uh, recommended for approval by the committee. Great, any discussion? Could I, get a, could I get a member of the committee to move? We have a motion, we have a motion on a second. All in favor, please say aye. Any opposed, any abstentions? All right, so we have a recommendation of approval for amendment one. Um, for amendment two and three, the, the sponsors aren't present. I'll defer to Actually, Councilmember Allen is present, so um, uh, Councilmember Allen, I will give you a second to discuss that one uh, for amendment number three. How do you recommend proceeding? Is it okay if just another well, committee member moves? Thank you. Okay. All right, um, could I get uh, a committee member to move amendment two, and then I will uh, give Councilmember Allen just a second to, uh, to uh, describe it, so, okay. So we have that, so I will recognize Councilmember Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Uh, I have attended some of the East Bank uh, meetings on community input and one of the, well, th there have been many things that have been important to the community that have come through in that. And the language in our, uh, in this bill is appropriately vague, which it needs to be for an RFP, but I wanted to at least refer to something that has more specificity about the things that people have said are important, specifically affordable housing and, and parks and other things like that. So this amendment simply adds a reference to um, to the priorities that are mentioned or referenced in, uh, in the Imagine East Bank vision, just to give us some more guidance to um, the procurement department. So I would ask for support for that amendment. Great, thank you for doing that. Is there any other discussion on amendment two? So we have, it's already been moved and seconded. All in favor, please say aye. Any opposed? 
Any abstentions? All right, so we have a recommendation of approval for Amendment 2. And then could I get a member of the committee to move uh, Amendment 3, Councilmember Bradford, uh, thank you for that. And then uh, could I call on Ms. Darby to uh, describe that one for us? Yeah, this uh, is the amendment that's been in the packet um, for the last meeting, and it essentially states that the solicitation um, utilize minority or women-owned business enterprises as appropriate. Is there any other discussion on on that? So we have, um, uh, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, so we have a recommendation for that. Um, uh, Vice Chair uh, Rutherford, could I get you to move the bill with all of those amendments? Uh, I move approval. I move approval with um, uh, as as amended. All right. Uh, is there a second? We have a second. Any any remaining discussion on this one? All right. All in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Great, thank you everyone for getting through that one. Um, the next item is item number six. This is Ordinance Bill 2022-1533. Um, this, uh, the lead sponsor is Councilmember Rosenberg, whom I'll recognize in a second. This accepts an easement on certain property located at 730, 7034 Charlotte Pike, owned by Lowe's Home Centers, LLC. Um, can I call on Vice Chair Rutherford to move this item and then we will recognize? I move approval. Uh, all right, and then uh, thank you. And uh, now I'll uh, turn it over to Councilmember Rosenberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd just like to ask what the purpose of this easement for building a fence is, please. And I did not have that information. Was Does the administration have it? Go ahead. Thank you. I, hopefully, Mr. Phil Luckett is here from the Metro Parks Department. Uh, I think I see him coming forward now. All right, go ahead, please. Uh, yes, the amendment, um, sorry, the easement for the fence is for when at such time uh, the park is clear of all inhabitants that we can uh, close the close the park for remediation of that park for opening at a later time back to the public. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Uh, any any further comment, Councilor Rosenberg? Um, I appreciate it. the the original item that went to the Parks Board said that the purpose of the fence was to uh, facilitate the closing of the park. So I guess my question is, would it be okay for us to add an amendment that says that no fencing would occur until the park is um, no longer inhabited? That that is our that, that is our intent. Okay, um, I'm going to uh, file a an amendment and if we're able to do it late file tomorrow and everybody ends up cool with it. Actually, I guess there's no rush on it. So I guess um, if there's no objection, we could defer it one meeting so that we could add an amendment, just adding that in there since the fence isn't gonna happen for a while anyway. Is that an issue at all? Is that good? I, Because I'm not unsure when there will be nobody inhabiting the park. Okay, I'd like to, well, You'd like to the committee can do what it would like I tonight. To tomorrow, oh, my intention will be to ask for a deferral for one meeting. Okay, um, Vice Chair Rutherford, would you move um, one meeting deferral? Certainly, I, I move for a one meeting deferral. All right, we have a motion and a second for a one meeting deferral at the request of the sponsor. Our next item, uh, we have two items from Councilmember Hall. Appreciate Councilmember Hall being here to join us today. This is item number 20, which is Bill 2022-1399. Um, the sponsor is Councilmember Hall. It amends the Metro Zoning Code by changing from RS-15 to R-15 zoning for 4023 Meadow Road, approximately 175 feet south of Cedar. Um, and this is a disapproved bill, and I will recognize Councilmember Hall. 
Thank okay. you, Chair. Um, so maybe many of you guys will remember from last meeting or at public hearing, um, this one and the next bill behind it, both are same neighborhood, two adjoining blocks. Um, they are disapproved bills. It's one of those things where we've approved eight new homes on one portion of one of these streets, two on the adjacent, but because the properties on one side can be done, but what we're asking is the same development or project, one house or one lot being split for two homes on the opposite side of the same street. And so it was disapproved from planning, but that's uh, where we are on this. And I'll make sure tomorrow, um, I believe the email may not have gone out, but it will have photos of specifically of uh, what these two projects look like. Like I said, there are eight homes already approved to be new, and these are just where it's two lots that are being split to add an additional home on each lot um, facing one another on the same block. Any, does the planning table have anything to add? Okay. Um, all right, great. Um, does anyone on the committee have any discussion on, on this item or potentially the next one? Um, what I'll, uh, as was referenced, these uh, these two items did come before the Planning Commission. Um, I believe they're both in a neighborhood maintenance policy area and and the Planning Commission disapproved, but I'll recognize planning to speak to it. Hi, yes, um, so item number 20 on the agenda, um, was recommended for disapproval. This is a rezoning request from R RS15 to R15. Um, this would permit um, a two family dwelling unit to be constructed um, where single family is permitted now. This is within neighborhood evolving, but it's immediately adjacent to neighborhood maintenance and there's a pretty consistent lot and block pattern. Um, across the street, the planning commission and subsequently council did approve a rezoning to R15. That one is positioned a bit differently in that it's adjacent to a mixed use corridor policy behind it that fronts on Clarksville Pike. And so we saw this side, the west side of Meadow more as a transition to the neighborhood maintenance. Okay, thank you for that. Any other discussion? Councilman Bradford. There you go. Thank you, Chair. So my question is on the whole Nashville Next and these neighborhood evolvings. You know, as we've heard, this area is neighborhood evolving, but because this property happens to be literally on the wrong side of the street, Planning Commission disapproved this. So my real question and curiosity is, if we're gonna have whole areas listed as neighborhood evolving, why does it matter which side of the street they're on? I will recognize the planning table to respond to that. Certainly. So when you're talking, when we're thinking about sort of the the CCM, the Community Character Manual, as it's applied countywide, um, you have a lot of differences between even T3 neighborhood evolving from one side of the county to the other. And so the the policies are very broad um, in community in the Community Character Manual, but the context of where it sits within a policy is important. So if something was in Embedded sort of in the middle of a neighborhood evolving policy and had two family units around it and there was an irregular lot and block pattern, we may consider it differently. Or if it's adjacent to a more intense policy, such as the properties that are on the east side, which are adjacent to mixed use corridor, we view that differently. This stretch of property along the west side of Meadow has a, a consistent single family pattern and is adjacent to neighborhood maintenance. And so the location within a policy and the context within that policy is also appropriate or is also important when we're thinking about um, recommendations. So the community character manual is gonna give a range of zonings that could be appropriate within neighborhood evolving, but we're gonna look for those context clues when we're making our recommendations. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Councilman Bradford. Any other discussion? All right. All in favor, please say aye. Any opposed? Please say aye. I see two. And opposed. Can I get folks to raise your hand if you're uh, opposed? One, two, three. One, two, three. And I will be as well. So. What's 
Is any abstentions on this one? We have one abstention. Okay. And so then we have one member who's four. One approved. Because we've got seven who are here. Could I flip this around maybe and uh, ask committee members who are in support of this one to raise your hand as well, just while we're doing it. So any committee members who are for the ordinance? No. And then we have what we had recorded as five against and one abstention. Okay. Um, we, uh, that will be our recommendation is five against one not voting. Um, now we will move on to item number 21, ordinance bill 20. 22-1403, also by Councilman Rahal. Um, this one amends the Metro Zoning Code by changing from RS-15 to R-15 zoning for 3826 Fairview Drive. Um, and I will uh, turn it over to Councilman Rahal. Thank you, Chair. Um, this one's almost identical. Um, in terms of placement, what would separate this one from the other is this is actually almost at the dead end portion of this street. Um, you heard from the property owners that own the adjacent property in support of at public hearing. Um, there have been, it, it's a dilapidated corner of the road, several or a ton of complaints from codes. We're just trying to clean that block up. Again, these are two adjo adjoining streets right mm -hmm. near Timothy Park. And so this one in particular is at the end of Fairview, um, like I said, dead end, right at an intersection. And both of these um, blocks are intersections that are within two intersections of Clarksville Pike. So I'll, almost identical to the previous, but placement on this one is near a dead end, and you heard from the adjoining property owners. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Councilman Paul. Any, anything to add from planning on that one? Go ahead. The, the, poli the land use policy on this one is neighborhood maintenance. This one is neighborhood yes. maintenance. Okay, thank you for confirming that. All right, so um, could I get a motion? So we have, it's moved, it's seconded. All in favor, could I get committee members to raise your hands, please? Any opposed? One, two, three, so that'll be four. Any abstentions? One abstention. I'm sorry, also abstention? Two abstentions, all right. That will be our recommendation. We'll be um, four against, two abstentions. Next, uh, for the, if it's deferral for Councilman Rosenberg's, did we, Councilman Bradford asked if we had taken, if we actually took a vote on the deferral? It's for the, the one about the fence, for Rosenberg. We do need to go back to an item, and I apologize for that. And this is for the uh, the item that had the, we had the discussion about the fence, but I forgot to take a vote on it, so I apologize. I'm uh, falling down on the job up here, so. So we had, so this is for Ordinance Bill 2022-1533. This is, pertains to the fence. Councilmember Rosenberg requested a one meeting deferral. We had a motion on the second. So for the one meeting deferral, all in favor, please say aye. Any opposed, any abstentions? All right, thank you for letting us put that on the record. Now. Now we are up to item number uh, 2022, which is uh, Substitute Ordinance Bill 2022-1412. The sponsors are Council Member Sledge and several others. This amends uh, sections of the Metro Code relative to parking minimums. Um, could I get a motion on the bill? And then we do have some substitutes. So we have a motion, is there a second? Uh, and I will recognize Council Member Sledge to talk through the Substitute. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I, if it would help for the committee, I'd ask that you move the second substitute that has my name on it. That makes sense. Okay. There's two things that are listed as second substitute. All right. And then could we get a description of the substitute? Yes, absolutely. So the second substitute has one um, small adjustment. 
it adds, uh, members will remember when we talked on second reading and during public hearing, um, there had been a concern regard, well, there were two concerns. I'll talk about the other one with the main bill. One of the concerns was regarding uh, neighborhood landmark overlays um, and whether they would have parking minimums. It was a particular concern in one neighborhood. Um, but what this substitute does is it adds neighborhood landmark overlays passed after this, after this date um, to have the parking minimum requirements in much the similar way. It's in the same section as the substitute as um, existing UDOs, existing SPs. Um, so what it does is it makes sure that those parking minimums exist for those land neighborhood landmark overlays, which we know are kind of few and far between, but we also know that there are some that are <laughs> being considered at the moment. So um, I would ask for your support on the second substitute. It comes after community discussion. Is there any other discussion? I, I have some comments, but I want to, uh, actually, if I could call on planning about this one. Um, and so the neighborhood landmark in particular happens to be in District 6. Um, and so I, we've had a lot of discussion with neighbors about that for a while now, and that particular neighborhood landmark is indefinitely deferred. But um, could you, uh, Lisa, reiterate for us, A, uh, how, land, how neighborhood landmarks uh, are, are handled from a parking standpoint today, number one, and number two, uh, how this uh, facet of this uh, amendment would, uh, would change that. Certainly. So neighborhood landmarks, um, and we do have a lot of them within the um, within our more urban areas. Um, neighborhood landmarks, the entire point of it is to permit a use um, in what is typically a residential zoning district um, for the adaptive reuse of a building that is important to the community. They don't necessarily have to be historic, sort of capital H, historic age or architecture important, but just important to the community because they're unique or or any other many, many reasons why they may be important. And so a neighborhood landmark overlay um, serves as a tool wherein those uses through an appropriate zoning and adoption of a, a site plan are allowed to have uses other than what the, the base zoning, which is generally residential, would be. Um, so the neighborhood landmark overlay district process requires that a site plan be included. And when reviewing those site plans, we in planning would be looking for things such as how is parking going to be provided, um, understanding that those are typically uses that are sort of being applied on top of additional uses other than what would be permitted by the base zoning. And so those are intended to, to, to work with communities and be and provide something that's context sensitive to the community. Um, and so the code as it relates to neighborhood landmarks indicates that um, parking standards other than that which is expressed explicitly in the code can be um, included and so um, I think this is just a, this um, substitute would be a way to um, sort of shore that up a bit to, to say that the minimums are still applicable. Uh, thank you for that. So I, I think maybe a short version is to say that even if, if this ordinance were to pass, planning would still look at um, neighborhood needs for things like parking in reviewing a site plan. And then for this substitute, uh, I guess a question that I would have for, for planning is, does this, um, does this addition sort of limit or inhibit the ability to further to, to continue looking at neighborhood landmarks on a case by case basis. Um, I don't think so. I think it sets. I, th I think it sets a um, a sort of floor for a starting point. But no, I don't. I don't think that it would necessarily um, create a situation where you wouldn't be able to do neighborhood landmarks. Um, a lot of the times with neighborhood landmarks, some of the uses are um, uses that are in the code that um, require the zoning administrator to determine parking. And so a lot of the times we're asking for parking studies or um, uh, demand studies anyway as part of establishing a neighborhood landmark. And so, um, no, I don't think that it would inhibit um, the use of neighborhood landmarks as a tool for adaptive reuse. Okay, thank you so much for that.
right, any other discussion on um, the council member's ledger substitute? Uh, council member Gamble. Thank you. Just wondering, and I, I haven't looked at the uh, substitute in detail, if it addresses uh, the UDO um, issue where, where neighbors were concerned about the urban design overlay um, being, a, being impacted by this parking um, change. Okay, I'll go ahead and recognize planning. Yes, so the original, the first substitute that was put on the bill actually included a clause that indicated that for UDOs that utilize the UZO standard, that will continue to apply as a minimum. Um, and so we didn't want to undo sort of that work that had been done in those communities when the UDOs were established, such as a good example is the downtown Donaldson UDO, which refers to UZO standards. And so we wanted to make sure that those continue to remain as minimums in those instances, and so it would still be required. And so that was adopted with the previous substitute and, and, and stays with, with this one, yes. Okay. Thank you for that. Any other discussion on the uh, Councilmember Sledge's substitute? Um, what should we do with Councilmember Murphy's? All right, um, let's do this. Let's um, get a vote count on Councilmember Sledge's substitute <laughs> uh, for a recommendation. So we have a motion and a second. Can I get folks to raise your hands if you're in favor of Councilmember Sledge's substitute? Two, two, three. That'd be eight. Yes. Great, so our recommendation for that uh, substitute is eight in favor. Um, zero against and zero not voting. Could I get a member to uh, move Council Member Murphy's substitute? Okay, so uh, we have a motion and a second on Council Member Murphy's substitute. Could I get uh, a description of that one, um, Matthew? So um, Council Member Murphy's substitute um, essentially just establishes a portion of the UZO that would not fall under the provision of the parking maximum uh, no parking minimum change. And the boundaries of that are I-40 to the north, 440 to the east, um, Woodlawn, and whatever that little road would, I can't remember the name of the Woodlawn turns into for that little bit, to the um, south, and then White Bridge to the, it basically just removes um, the UZO out, it, that's within District 24 from being included in this change. Okay, uh, thank you for that description. And um, I'll go back to Councilmember Sledge. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I would ask committee members to vote against this substitute. Uh, I've had no discussions about this, and I, I don't think it'd be appropriate to just exempt one council member's district. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. I, I will share, I kind of agree as well, that I think if we start parceling out pieces of the UZO that, it, it, that will uh, lead to chaos, no matter how well intended they could be. Councilmember Mendez. Um, thanks for recognizing me when I'm not on the committee. Um, I agree with um, both y'all. I just wanted to mention that um, there are already um, uh, large chunks of the district that are on corridors that are already, um, I think, uh, how, how does that work? It, it, on it, some of the multimodal street corridors that they already uh, are exempt from right. uh, the parking restrictions, if the majority of their frontage is on the corridor. And I think we've heard a lot about one property in particular where the majority of it is on a side street, but yeah. not the corridor. So, so I think most most of the rest of what's in, in planning could confirm this. I think most of the rest of what's included in that exclusion zone is um, zone single family where, where there really shouldn't be an impact at all from this. Uh, planning, go ahead, if you'd like to respond to that. The, the large, yeah, the large portion of that is single family um, minus um, the sort of Murphy Road where the roundabout is, which is zoned commercially, um, and is probably the one little area that is outside of the half mile radius for um, transit access, um, but is largely built out. Um, but that one area is, is 
commercially zoned that node across from McCabe. And he, he, even that roundabout area, as I understand it, might be commercial just one lot deep. So it's not like there can be very substantial development there. There, yes, those are pretty limited. Um, the, the parcel sizes are somewhat limited from their, just their geometry for the depth and it is only one parcel deep, yeah. That, that Chair, that just goes in the category of, aside from the philosophical objections that y'all noted, I think it, it really wouldn't make much of a difference. And so I, I think it should be a no. Okay, thank you for that, Councilmember Mendez. Councilmember Allen. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Cash may have said all this already. I, I've had some good conversations about those areas that fall outside of the one half mile radius of bus stops and, and are there ways that WeGo can support through their WeGo link program? And I've talked with uh, Director Alicone about uh, parking possibilities and things like that. I think there are good solutions, but I feel like between that, that specific area and also the lot that Councilmember Cash has been speaking about, um, there are some neighborhoods that have been significantly impacted by people parking at commercial areas and using the free parking on the, in the neighborhoods as their free parking. And you know, if there if there are solutions down the road, um, I think we maybe get more of a blessing from the public if we offer them the opportunity to hear about some of those. Um, so I, I would request a two meeting deferral just to allow. Councilmember Sledge to continue his road show. I don't, I don't know how it went with Edge, Edge Hill, but I know a couple other neighborhoods that that just need to be brought up to speed with. I mean, and just and, and I've asked for information on when we've done this, how much of a difference has it actually made, and that may be comforting information. Um, so I, I feel like this is this is a, a solution that that makes sense in terms of, uh, from the affordable housing standpoint, giving more flexibility to, to build housing that doesn't pay for parking that they don't need. Um, but I, I do think it's really important to acknowledge the neighborhoods that, that have expressed concern and um, perhaps just provide a little bit more time to answer those questions. And I would ask for a two meeting defer, I would ask for someone else to move for a two meeting defer, I'm not on this committee. Well, we will uh, consider that, I'm sure. Um, thank you, thank you for that feedback. Um, Councilmember Harker. Thank you, Chair. Um, I had just a, a quick couple of clarifying questions, and I was out in the hallway for some of the discussion, so I apologize if I missed anything, but um, this could go to either the planning table or to um, Director Darby. Um, so so I just want to confirm something that was talked about at the Planning Commission, that uh, this would not change minimum required... I'm sorry, I'm speaking on the bill. Is that appropriate at this time? Have we voted on that substitute Let's yet? Uh, yeah, we're, right now we're just on the substitute, but yeah, if, it, if it's on the bill, we'll come back to that. If, that's if okay. you'd come back to me when we get on the bill, please. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on the Murphy substitute? Um, so I'm going to ask for a show of hands. So all in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Two, two, three, four. Up to nine, yeah. So that will be nine against. Any not voting? Thank you. Um, so that's for the Murphy substitute. So now we'll be uh, back on the bill. Uh, we will assume that it will be the bill with Councilmember Sledge's uh, substitute. Um, and uh, so I'll go back to Councilmember Parker and then of course I'll recognize Councilmember Sledge. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a couple of quick questions for um, hopefully the planning table will be able to answer these. Um, at the Planning Commission, it was discussed, um, and I just want to confirm that I heard this right, that um, this would not impact requirements for uh, handicapped spaces. Uh, those are determined by like building code or so something else other than the parking requirements in the zoning code. So the, the code has a very general statement about handicapped parking shall be provided as required, but there's not an explicit requirement in the zoning code. That is generally going to be covered by um, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and it is typically a per, uh, number of spaces per spaces that are provided. Um, and so smaller lots typically will and in some cases, and I'm not an expert on ADA, I will say that, in some cases aren't required to have any. So it's it's a, it's a based on the number of spaces provided, but it is per ADA, not the zoning code. Okay, thank you. Um, and then um, I know there's some language in the substitute about 
um, SPs that reference UZO parking standards. Um, if, say, I've got a zoning bill, an SP within the UZO, and we define parking standards, minimum parking numbers in that SP, um, would this bill, um, uh, I don't want to use a negative word, like undermine, but would this bill override those uh, those parking requirements that we put in an SP within the UZO? No, and, okay. and we put some language in there essentially indicating that parking established by an SP is still the parking established by the SP. And so, um, and SPs going forward, we'll just have to be very clear in our language that this is the minimum, this is what you have to do. I mean, SPs are sort of, uh, create your own adventure zoning sure. in a way. And so we would be very explicit in any future SPs about the number of spaces or the ratio of spaces that would be required. But yeah, so any existing it SP that it has- It doesn't undo anything. We, we wrote that in, yes. Thank you. I just wanted to make a thousand percent certain of that. Um, and thank you all for the information and I'll be, um, I'll be voting in favor of this, so thank you. Great, thank you so much, Councilmember Parker. Councilmember uh, Cash, and Councilmember Sledge, I'll come to you last, if that's okay, unless you unless you need me to jump in sooner, but um, Councilmember Cash. Come on, thanks. Thanks for recognizing me, even though I'm not on the committee, and I do have a handful of questions that um, I did send to staff, and um, so cut me off if you need to. Uh, in the interest of time, but, um, and I, I uh, share what Councilmember Allen said that, that I do have some constituents. We just kind of had a meeting about, uh, a community meeting about a um, development on the 21st Avenue corridor. One that has a side street, has more frontage than 21st Avenue. And so they are um, expressing some concern in numbers uh, about this bill. Um, so I would like to, like to see more time to make sure um, different Different neighborhoods have have a chance to uh, weigh in on it, and you know, and we've got several changes that are taking place in the next two days, possibly. But um, I want to ask about as it relates to SPs, and I uh, thought I understood. I thought some of the what I was going to ask, I was sure about, but now based on something that Milligan said, I'm not. So, does this bill el uh, eliminate our ability to uh, require certain? Parking in an SP, in an SP zoning bill. No, no. We can still. A SPs will still, each SP will establish its own parking standard. So uh, for SPs that are already existing, we have a lot of SPs that have less parking than what UZO requires. We have SPs that have higher standard or higher uh, ratio than what the UZO requires. We have SPs that just say UZO as a minimum. And so it's already, because SPs are intended to be context sensitive, it's already something that we look at with SPs. And so even moving forward, we would still want to make sure that we're doing what's appropriate for that context of the SP as it relates to parking. Okay. I think I got that. I think I got a misunderstanding about that. Um, so... Okay, so I'm gonna skip. So, so actually, what this may not be as relevant, but what what for like do, do many SPs just like in terms of a low number, or a medium number, a high number? The many SPs like include something about parking. Uh, I I would I would hazard a guess that probably 100% um, because it is creating a standard. Um, okay. I mean, it's creating the zoning. Um, even, you know, we have regulatory SPs, we have design-based SPs for the most part, they're all gonna at least refer to a minimum. I mean, there are hundreds and I have obviously not reviewed every one of them, but I can't think of any in the eight years that I have been here that don't establish what the parking minimums are. Okay, um, also as it relates to SPs, um, like we, we've heard on this bill that, that many other cities have done this um, and, and done so successfully uh, and you know, in some form, maybe it's not exactly like this, but in some form or fashion. Uh, and yet in Tennessee, we're one of three or four states that the state tells us we can't include, um, we can't negotiate uh, affordable housing. We can't include it in SPs. It's like their laws against us. Uh, being able to, our, our hands are tied in a lot of um, in a lot of ways in trying to get some affordable housing. I think that's why we have 
you know, in a couple of cases, groups that are negotiating a CBA to um, and getting affordable housing included. So do, do you think that that will, the, our lack of ability to re, uh, pass laws about affordable housing in Nashville will weaken the impact of the, the effectiveness of this bill that intends to, in part to um, reduce, I mean, increase affordable housing? That quite, did that make sense? Yes, and so I would say that so um, reduce or eliminating parking minimums. Um, one thing that it that it can do is create more options and flexibility when you're building housing of all types and all ranges. But parking um, as a component of building especially when you start to get into structured parking is one of the most expensive pieces. And we have heard over and over from affordable housing developers um, that it is one of the things that sort of um, impedes some of the development of affordable housing. And so that is one aspect of it. Um, no, we can't re require affordable housing, but eliminating parking minimums has other benefits as well, um, not just providing that flexibility. And so that's sort of one piece of it, but it also improves urban form when you when you get rid of, um, when you eliminate parking. Um, it can, a lot of the times, um, Providing parking can actually um, create more car traffic as opposed to encouraging people to seek other modes of transit or other modes of transportation or transit or biking or walking. Right. And so it can some degree induce demand. And so the, the, the flexibility for housing is sort of one piece of it, but there are a lot of other things that eliminating parking actually can improve in the urban environment. And so like two, two and a half years ago, we passed a bill um, that eliminated parking minimums on corridors. Have we seen any, um, what have we seen as a result of that? Have we seen more affordable housing? Have we seen like documentable uh, improved form? Ooh. Is it too short of a period to know? I think it's almost, it's, it's it's pretty quick when you start talking about, uh, because a lot of projects, if they were probably, if they were like in the queue, they probably moved forward with whatever plans had already been developed. And so um, I would have to look and do some research um, on permits that have been issued or probably issued recently because it can take a good bit of time to get grading permits and all those things reviewed. Um, and so I would I would have to do some research, so I'm not sure that I have a good answer for that. Okay, and one more, and then I promise I'm done. Uh, so it kind of on the on that it, it, along those lines, um, like what what kind of metric would we use to see if the previous bill or this bill, when it becomes law, what 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 kind of metric would we look at to see quantifiable results? Some of the things that I mentioned, I mean, I think an increase in housing of all rates um, along our corridors, um, better urban form, things that are less car centric, more people focused um, would be some of the metrics that we would that we would be looking for. I mean, you have a lot of times where um, Sometimes the parking can drive the form as opposed to um, creating a more pedestrian friendly or um, pedestrian focused development. So um, I think that those would be some of the, the metrics that we would be looking at. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Cash. If, if I could, uh, I know when I get us to a vote here quickly, but I know this is really good discussion that I hope uh, we're all taking in now and maybe it'll save us some time on the floor. Um, uh, if I could ask a question of planning, um, some of the feedback that we heard at the Planning Commission hearing itself, as well as I think a little bit at the Council Public Hearing, uh, was from the builder community and they had some concerns in some cases about the parking maximum component um, and provided some information about uh, projects that they had constructed and how the how having a parking maximum uh, uh, in, in place that is less than the amount that they provided for those buildings might hinder their projects going forward could you speak to that a little bit certainly so I think what 
to some extent might have been not explicit on that chart was it talked about parking required and parking provided, but it didn't necessarily talk about parking demand and how many of the provided spaces are actually utilized. Um, and so that's sort of one piece of it, and, and I've tried to dig in and, and sort of get some more information on that and haven't haven't gotten that to date. But um, providing it does not necessarily mean that it is needed to actually serve the development. So I think that's one piece that's sort of missing from that. But that said, if there was a development that wanted to provide parking above what would be set as the maximum, you, there is an option. You could go to the BZA um, to ask for a variance to that parking standard. So there is relief available. And one thing on, on that point uh, is that um, the provision of parking presently is uh, not counted toward floor area ratio for a building. And so if uh, someone had a project, they went to the Board of Zoning Appeals, the Board of Zoning Appeals does not have authority to amend floor area ratio in the base zoning. And so it, if they had a situation where they needed, for whatever reason, to provide more parking, would that then count against their available floor area ratio? So that's already true. So right now in the code, let's say just for ease of math, that you were required to have five spaces and you provide 10, you were only allowed to exempt five spaces from your FAR. Anything over the required, you are not allowed right Right now currently to exempt and so it would be just inversing that and so you would be allowed to exempt up to the maximum but anything above that would not be able to be exempt and so it's very similar to how it's handled now you can only exempt right now up to the required okay above that you cannot exempt from your FAR okay thank you that, that's helpful for me because I know we had a few people that asked about it and I appreciate everyone giving me that time any other discussion from committee members on the bill with council Councilmember Sledge a substitute. All right, so um, Councilmember Rutherford, would you move the bill? Uh, motion on the bill as substituted. As substituted, is there a second? We have a second. I'm going to ask for hands on this one. Uh, we have had some additional attendees, but so all in favor of the bill with Council. Oh, hang on a second. I do have some discussion, which is for Councilmember Sledge. And we do have a motion for it, but uh, I was very happy like to for everybody vote. But um, <laughs> what, what, what I will say, there is one additional item that I wanted to report back to council on um, that's referenced in the planning staff's analysis, which is um, residential permit parking enforcement and parking enforcement as a whole. Um, Director Alarcon, I believe, is, is out um, today, but she did give me permission to relay what was discussed at this meeting we had with Edgefield as well. Um, right now we have five residential permit parking enforcement officers. That number is going to 15. Um, that number is going to 15 fairly quickly. Our parking modernization bill provided for eight of those positions and Director Alarcon is moving an additional two of her staffers into parking enforcement. I don't wanna steal her thunder on the mechanisms that are gonna be used, but um, what's gonna be used is an electronic sort of quote unquote chalking system for those who are, are familiar with chalking tires um, as to how long they sit um, in a particular parking space. So I know that that came up a lot and because it was referenced in the um, analysis and planning about here is a tool that neighborhoods can use for this, we are about to get way more robust on parking enforcement and um, I know that that's been something that's been discussed several of us as members, myself included, um, and so I do want to say that we have discussed that. NDOT has been um, out front about that and said that there will be there will be changes and you will see a parking program here in the city where you have not seen it previously. Thank you, Chair. And uh, Councilor Sledge, did yeah. you have a, a uh, do you have a request with, uh, we do have a request not by a committee member, but for a, def, a two meeting deferral. Uh, do you have a perspective on that? I would request that the committee not defer the bill. We have talked about this a lot over the last three months. I was just kind of jotting down all the media interviews that I have done or that one of us have done over those three months. I do understand there's concern about a particular, um, it sounded like a particular parcel um, over on 21st Avenue. Um, as noted by Ms. Milligan, there are zoning options to, to ensure if, the re, if a rezoning is to occur there, there are zoning options for parking to be um, thought of and put in place. So no, I, I would ask committee members that we be able to move forward um, with this because I do think we've had a really, uh, as I've noted before, I think we've had a really good discussion about this. 
and I do think we have the opportunity to, to move forward. Thank you, Chair. Great, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Gamble. Thank you. Just a question about the permit process, and I'm not sure if someone is here from NDOT that can speak to this, but what is the process for a a acquiring a residential parking permit, and what is the cost for that? Because what I don't, I I'm not sure if, if there has been any consideration for um, residents in North Nashville, particularly uh, in regards to um, having to, to do that permit process. So if I could just get a little bit information. Sure, um, actually, uh, Council Member Pulley, um, for your Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, I think that's a little bit more of, they, they kind of work with NDOT on some of those things a little bit more, is that something, I just want to get us, don't want to have us tied up too late. Is that something that you would be able to discuss when this bill comes before your committee tomorrow? Okay. Th that'll be fine, yeah. but in that case, I do uh, support a two-meeting deferral because it sounds like we there is still some information and aspects of this that we want to make sure we don't in unintentionally burden uh, residents with this. So for that, I, I support a two-meeting deferral. So are you making a motion for a two-meeting deferral? Because you are the, on the committee. So. Oh, okay, yes. I thought we had one. Okay, so we now have a motion for a two-meeting deferral, um, and I will go back to, is there a second? We have a second on the two meeting deferral motion. I'll go back to council member Sledge. Uh, thank you. I did state my position on the two meeting deferral. I will I will try to address as best I can just as a fellow colleague regarding uh, residential permit parking because we do have some in district 17. It's typically a petition process. Um, the street has to come out um, with a hit a percentage threshold of the part of the parcel owners um, who want to um, put on there. They have to put on the petition the um, actual license plates for which they want permits. Once they file that petition with traffic and parking, traffic and parking reviews it. The permit cost, I believe, is $10 annually. Um, I know it's been remarked in- That may change. But that yeah. may change. I, I know it's been remarked in the past that that's actually one of the, the cheapest rates around, like in the country around. Um, and then there is a process for, uh, there was a question that came up in the community meeting I had last week about guest parking. Um, right now there is a process for guest parking. That process is gonna become a phone number that you call. Again, this is from Director Alarcon. A phone number that you call, it will be, she insisted that it will be staffed around the clock um, for guests um, to obtain those guest permits. Um, and that's the most I can speak to it. And she did also say she, that the department is gonna be coming back around to areas that already have RPP to ask them what's working, what's not working, do they wanna see things change, whatever it might be. So again, not speaking as a member of NDOT obviously, but um, there was a very there was a very robust discussion that they're gonna do, they're gonna do a lot of legwork on that. So, so um, if I could, uh, 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 I think Councilmember Bradford, you have a question on that relates to the deferral. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair. One reason I decided to second the motion to defer is I have another question that probably has not been asked or addressed that probably needs the extra time, and that is, you know, I represent a district that is predominantly, if not 100%, not in the UZO, and so my question that I would like to hear answered is what happens in the future if the UZO ever expands into areas where there, that's not the UZO and you have neighborhoods that may not have been okay with this, but are okay with it because, hey, it doesn't affect my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. what's, what's the process if that was ever to change? Would they have the option to opt in, opt out? How would that affect an expanding UZO? I'll defer to the planning table. Certainly, so I can talk a bit about the process of expanding the UZO, just from a process standpoint. Um, it has only happened a couple of times in recent years that I can think of, and it has been at the request of the community um, and applied for by the council member. Um, and so it is a zoning overlay, much like other zoning overlays, contextual overlays, corridor design overlays, which are largely um, resident driven. We also really, with extensions of the um, UZO are looking for a more urban pattern. Um, what the, that's the sort of first 
word in it. And so we're looking for an urban pattern. It was originally covering the old city limits of Nashville. And so it has extent, expanded, excuse me, but not greatly beyond those. Um, but only to sort of more urban areas. And so um, it is generally a community driven process. Um, I can't think of a time where we have just sort of said, you're now in the UZO, it's treated like other zoning overlays and goes through a public hearing at the Planning Commission Council, all of that. So basically, you know, if an uh, area was wanting to go into UZO, they'd be told up front, hey, here's everything that the UZO allows and that includes the abolition of minimum parking standards. That's yes, correct. yes, that's correct. Thank you. Any other discussion on the deferral motion? Councilmember Rutherford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I'm, I'm speaking a, against the deferral motion. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that that's really going to get us where it's, it's, some members are asking us to go. I'm not. I don't think that it's going to be that beneficial to us to uh, defer. And I would rather give the full council um, the ability to uh, have the debate and make that decision uh, rather than here in the committee. And clearly, this, the, it's not the sponsor's wishes either. Uh, this seems um, fully vetted to me, and, and I'm uh, in support of the bill and opposed to the deferral motion. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Rutherford. I'll go back to Council for Gamble. Uh, I'm fine. Um, I, I, I still motion for the deferral. I guess I, one question is in regards to the one meeting and two meeting, as opposed to uh, a two meeting as opposed to a one meeting. I am willing to do the one meeting. I don't know if that, the timing was for additional community meetings, if that was the suggestion for the two meetings. Okay, yes, that seems to be the suggestion for the two meetings. So in that case, I do um, do stick to the motion for the two meeting deferral. And I appreciate the um, responses to some of the questions that I had in regards to the permit process and how that might uh, inadvertently uh, <laughs> cause some issues for residents, uh, particularly long-term residents in the North Nashville area. And I'm not sure if any of these community meetings that are planned, if you have any that will be held in the North Nashville community, but I would recommend that we use this time to do that as well, just so that everybody has a good understanding of what is being proposed and how it would impact them uh, in their daily life and quality of life. Okay, Councilmember Allen, did you want to speak on the deferral? Uh, thank you, Mr. Generous, just in response to the, to the question about why two meetings, because most neighborhood associations meet once a month, and so that would allow the opportunity to catch the neighborhood associations that have been asking questions, and all the others that haven't started paying attention yet that will. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other discussion on the deferral? So we have, um, I'm going to do our uh, show of hands. So those who are in support of the deferral motion on the committee, please raise your hand. Those who are against the deferral, please raise your hand. Seven, so I'll be eight. Those who are not voting, um, all right, so the deferral motion fails, or is not recommended. So we go, we're back to the bill um, with Councilmember Sledge's substitute. Uh, is there any other discussion? All right, so show of hands, all who are in favor of the bill, all committee members in favor of the bill with the substitute, raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, be nine. The committee members who are against the bill as substituted. And any not voting. All right, so our committee recommends approval of Ordinance Bill 2022-1412 with uh, Councilmember Sledge a substitute, nine in favor, one against. And I believe that takes us to the end of our calendar for planning and zoning. I know this one was a long meeting. We've had a lot of discussion. I appreciate everyone's time uh, today and hope that this helps to shorten our discussion on the floor tomorrow. So uh, with that, I will declare our committee meeting adjourned. Thank you.